Hey y'all, today I'm gonna work on my ignition switch. I think I told you in a few episodes ago that I got the car to run, but I have to use a jumper to get it started. So the ignition switch has kind of the run position and the start position. The start position is when the motor or the starter motor is cranking, and when the starter motor is cranking, it does not provide 12 volts to the ignition coil, and so the engine won't start it ran when parked, so to speak. I took this car apart 15 plus years ago to do paint and body and rust repair. At that point, the ignition switch was fine and it's been sitting on a shelf for all that time. I think the contacts inside have probably degraded or corroded. Hopefully we can fix it. If not, we gotta replace it, but I always try. This will unscrew the bezel on here. It allows you to get it pretty tight so it doesn't wiggle and fall apart. There's also some, some washers that have little tabs on them, and those tabs fit right inside there. So that's what keeps it from, from rotating when you turn the key. When I put this in just a, a few weeks ago, I did check all these contacts are clean. So it's not a contact issue, it's something I think internal to the switch. And then from here, I've already disconnected the battery. Just gonna pull the wires off the back. This is the big wiring diagram and I'm focusing here on the back of the ignition switch and there's really only four wires that we need. We don't need the radio wire right now. Um, we need this big red wire. It comes from the light switch. We need this black wire that goes to fuse one. That's for the brake lights. The black and white wire is the one that's in suspect because that's the one that powers the coil. That's the coil right there. And then we also need this wire right here number 50, that's what goes to the starter motor. So we know that wire 50 is working because the starter motor is cranking. This wire is working because it's powering the coil when the engine's in the run position. And then this is the one that is, you know, for the brake lights, which aren't working yet either. And then the red wire is really the power source right to the battery. So we really need four wires, one, two, three, four. The blue and the yellow is to light up the uh, instruments, and so we don't need to light the instruments right now. So two wires are unnecessary for today. The back of the switch looks very much like the diagram here. So I did confirm that I had the, the diagram or the wires in the right place. It's really uh, not labeled on the back at all. There's a little clip down inside there. That's probably part of the lock tumbler. And then there's these indentations on the side that are just peened over or bent over and that locks it in place. It looks like it's got a, a marker here so it only goes back one way. Okay, this is just a regular flat screwdriver, a little jeweler's screwdriver, and I can get it in between the metal housing and this plastic boss here. And I can pry just a little bit and I can see things are starting to move a tad but I'm afraid I'm just gonna crack or break this insulation here, which is plastic. So I think what I might do is make a tool where I could lever against the steel part as opposed to the plastic part. Basically just make a little wrench that kind of pulls on it. I probably should have started with a better screwdriver because what's happening is the tip is bending. You need a pretty hard steel and I probably softened it a little bit when I welded it, but I did quench it in water 
trying to keep the hardness there, but I'm just working it around and I'm getting it to move. So what I'm doing is I'm just going really slow and just trying to yield the material just ever so slightly and just keep going around and around. I might be able to get it. Plus I can sometimes just hammer that back down. So I just flattened it back out, but it's really a cheap screwdriver. I've gone around a few times and it's, it's starting to get loose now. So I can now spin this on here. So it's hard to see the progress on camera, but when you're trying to coerce metal like that, it's better to do small, small um, adjustments rather than just try to do it all in one whack. That's something I picked up from hammer and dolly work. It takes multiple hits to get metal to move. You don't want to move it all in one hit. Okay, I think I got the tabs pretty well opened up. Let me show you from the end with my other camera. It feels like it wants to come off, but I think I'm still dealing with this uh, snap ring on the end. And I think, I think that has to come off as well before I can get the plastic to separate. Trying these dental pick tools. Uh, these aren't the best quality either. Probably not hard enough, but let's see if we can just get that to break loose. Yeah, I can feel it springing and I can feel it moving. So this is just something that's gonna be a, a delicate maneuver. This might take a while. Okay, there's the ring. It's a little bit uh, oblong now, but that's, uh, I got it out. So that's good. And I think this will just come apart. Yeah, boom. Oops, something just fell out. Shoot, there's a little washer here. Let me, let me move all this off the vise so we can keep track of all the pieces on the paper. Here's what I got so far. This is a little clip that I had to stretch to get off with the dental tools. This is a little washer that was between the cap and the contact points. So this has, I don't know if you can see, I'll have to get a close up. This has three little nubs on it. This one's pretty worn. It's a little bit worn down. Um, and then this one, you can see where the contacts are. <clears throat> it's also got a little bit of wear on it, but let's clean them up and see what we can do. And underneath here, Looks like there are some springs. Yep, three springs on, on that. So I'm not gonna lose the orientation. I'm gonna put it right there in the same way. Probably put this in the ultrasonic cleaner maybe. So there's, there's little you know bits of stuff down in there that can't be helping the matter. Lots of debris inside here. Yeah, so there's some little ratcheting um, features inside there, but there's no spring pressure as I turn that. So the spring pressure in the rotation comes from that spring right there. This is the torsion spring that prevents the key from staying in start. It'll, it'll snap back. You can see the amount of just grime and dirt in there. Lots of old grease and sand. So I like these wooden toothpicks for that. I just kind of scrape out that old grease. These two are like almost pristine. This one here has got some wear on it. So we'll have to decide what to do about that. We can probably just go on the back side and, and maybe reshape it with the right size tools or just bump it out a little bit. I don't think it's worn through. It just needs to be bumped up a little bit. 
could potentially solder on that, but I, I'm afraid that if we soldered on it, it would be too soft. And then this thing here is really just the contact points. And this just need, this is really dirty. So inside the jar, it's just Dawn dish soap. So I'm gonna put all this in. I'm gonna heat it up in the ultrasonic cleaner and spin it for, you know, 15 or so minutes. Okay, while those parts are in the ultrasonic cleaner, I've been playing with this switch and it appears that it has a lockout. So that's the start position. And then in order, once it's in the run position, you cannot go back to the start position. That's what all those little ratcheting paws in there are for. So that's really clever. You only, to, in order to reset it, you gotta go all the way back to off. Then you can start and then go back to run and then you can't go back to start again. So it, it has like this reset feature, which is really clever and it's working well in the switch. So another reason to keep the original parts Okay, all the parts are out of the ultrasonic cleaner. That's what the water looks like now. It's, it's got a lot of grime on the bottom of it too. Um, everything's been blown out and I actually, you know, spray some WD-40 in there because it does, you know, displace water. And everything is looking very clean. It's like brand new. I've cleaned up the contacts here, taken all that old grease off and things are looking uh, pretty decent. Now that the parts are clean, I've been getting acquainted with all the contacts and positions and so forth and I've realized I've made a big mistake. As it turns out it was not wired correctly. I have located the wire that goes to the distributor and it was connected to a contact that doesn't even really connect to anything internally to the switch. So I've gone back I've looked at some of the diagrams and done some more research which I should have done before I even started this and I found the problem. Okay, first off, there should be a, a paper label that goes inside that square right there. And that would have prevented all this problem because that would have told me exactly which terminals are the 30, which is the unswitched power, and which terminals are the 15, which is the switch power. That's what I got wrong. And it's really about the orientation of this switch because it's circular. When you look at the diagram, it could go, you know, like this because there's the three terminals on the bottom, three on the right. It could go like this or it could go like this. And I had it wired, you know, I think 90 degrees out. So I went to another set of diagrams I have. These are from Joe Leone. I've had these since looks like 2001. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, his diagram's a little bit better in that it actually shows the orientation of this square and the little opening in the square right here. That makes a huge difference because it tells you which direction it's oriented. And if you compare these two diagrams, they don't agree because here 50 is on the top right. That's to the starter. But <clears throat> he has this row here is this row here. So it's 90 degrees off. The 30 is on the left and the 30 here is on the bottom. So basically that's how I got confused. It's 90 degrees off. Everything is a little bit different um, when you look at these diagrams. And had this been label cor labeled correctly, I, I would have been correct. This is where I had the ignition wire. On the back of it, there's no terminal there. And I think that's really the root of the problem. When it was in the start position, there was no power going to the coil. So even though this diagram is schematically correct, it's not physically correct because the physical part of the switch doesn't line up with the terminals as they're displayed here. I've also looked at my original Cardex and <clears throat> this is, believe it or not, the same housing at least that's on the Cardex. So your, your Cardex gives you the uh, key code, the ignition key code. And the code is written right on the side of this. I'm not going to show it to the world, but it's, uh, it matches the Cardex. So this is the original switch. So it kind of makes sense, um, it, kind of the silver lining and all this, to go through the switch and keep it original, maintain it, um, preventative maintenance basically. So this, this should last another 50 years now that I've gone through and kind of refurbished it a little bit and fully understand how the contacts work. Hey, this is my uh, tiniest hammer. You guys know I like to fix a lot of things with hammers. And what I've done is I've created just a tiny little divot with my drill press in this piece of wood. And I've sharpened this just metal rod. 
that's about the same diameter as the contact. So I'm gonna look for the one that's a little bit depressed right there. I'm gonna set that in the, the recess and just give it a few taps. That's just gonna push the metal outward back into a dome. And of course it's a little bit thinner, but that's okay. This switch won't have the same amount of abuse as it did before due to those relays. Okay, that did seem to help. And now if I measure the heights of the bumps, I get 96, 99, and 96. So I'm just gonna go over them with a little bit of Scotch-Brite just to kinda clean them again. This is just some old gray Scotch-Brite. So I'm putting the most worn uh, dome away from the high current contacts, which like I said before, it's no longer a high current contact because the relay is elsewhere. And then I'm gonna put a little bit of um, grease on this. And I, what I have is dielectric grease. This may not be the best for this kind of contact, but it's better than nothing. And I know that it's not gonna bridge any of these contacts because it, it doesn't conduct electricity. So I'm just gonna put a, a, a slight amount here on the contacts, rub that around. And I'm just gonna use a spring clamp on this while I bend those tabs back over. It's on there nice and firm, that's not coming off. Plus there's that ring that's gonna keep it together as well. But that's good, which it does. You can feel the contacts in there working. Very distinctive um, detents. So before with, without the new grease, it, it was a little bit muddy, but this feels nice and notchy, feels great. So this is where the power comes in, and then this is where the power goes out, right here. So I'm just going to hold this like it is, on, and start. So that's going to power the coil in the run position and the start position. That's what we want. I just returned from the hobby store, and I got these two aluminum tubes. One is 3 16th and the other is 7 30 seconds. And so the idea here is I'm gonna try to open up that clip, slide it on the tube, and then push it onto the, uh, the recess where it belongs. Okay, the larger of the two seems to fit right over the little cone where the, the clip goes on. So I think that's gonna be perfect. That should slip right over. That's putting a little cone on the end so the clip might fit right over. I think I'm getting pretty close. Let me just even it out and we'll give it a whirl. It looks like it's gonna be secure enough, so I'm gonna leave it at that. However, I do wanna put the uh, paper labeling on there. Had that paper labeling been on there, it really would have saved me some effort. Although, 
rebuilding this was not a bad idea. Now that the label's in, it should be a little bit more clear how this works. So the 30 is lined up on the left. The 15s are there on the bottom. The 54 is on the right. And then the 50 is to the starter. And that's how this diagram is. Then going back to this one, this is what I think got me confused. This diagram shows the 30 on the bottom, which it's not. Um, the 30 is on the left. And the 15 is on the bottom, and I, this shows it on the right. All right, let's put it in. That's definitely tightening it against the dash. That's probably good. Perfect. Now the engine's out right now because I'm dealing with some balancing issues, but I have attached this light bulb to the coil wire. That's actually a bigger draw than the coil will provide. But that's going to tell me that the ignition wiring circuit is correct. That should be on. And this should be start. And the starter's in there, so I'm not going to let it run too much without a load on it. But that's off, on, start. Okay, regarding the engine, it's obviously still out. I just got a call like a few hours ago saying that my flywheel and pressure plate have been rebalanced. They also rebalanced the uh, crank pulley and the cooling fan. So fingers crossed, that'll take care of my issue. If there's time next week, I'll get the engine put back in and take it for another test drive. The guy at the balance shop said, absolutely, the pressure plate needs to be pinned onto the flywheel. There's just too much movement in the way that it fits with just the bolts alone. There's no other features on the flywheel that center it. So that's probably the issue. And uh, we'll know, we'll know next week. Take care guys, thanks for being here.